Well, good morning, church. It is good to see you this morning. It's good to be at the Woodlands. It's good to be at Harvest. And uh, as Susan said, my name is Pierce Drake. I'm a pastor over in Nashville at an incredible church called Providence. And so I bring all love from them. And uh, it's so good to be with you all this morning. My wife and I are spending New Year's, like we came in on Thursday night and uh, by planes, trains, and automobiles and a three-hour car ride. It's a whole story uh, we don't have time for next time maybe, but we are so honored to be with you. And this is our first time here. Um, we did not know, uh, I mean, we knew about the Woodlands. We had not been. Uh, we definitely did not, I did not know about HEB. Um, you guys, everybody's told me about it. So uh, maybe we can stop by on the way to the airport, Claire, and go check it out. Um, but we are so grateful to be here, like I said. And here's what I know. It's January 2nd, which means there's people in the room that have probably walked in here today because, hey, maybe a New Year's resolution Maybe something's been stirring in your heart. Maybe Jesus has been doing something. Maybe life's been really tough and you're like, I don't know, maybe I'll try this Jesus thing and I was headed down the road and through all the trees I saw the church and I pulled in and, and so thank you for being here. And I'm, I'm saying this on behalf of the team here, you don't have to believe everything to belong here. You have a place here, you have a seat here. And, uh, and so I just ask this, I'm new, you're new, so let's be new together, but just make me the promise that you'll come back next week and hear from uh, Mark and from Susan and from the team. That they're just such an incredible place. God's doing something really great here. And uh, they, have the, they have the audacity to ask a guest preacher to come the first Sunday of the year. So, But I am so grateful, like I said, to be here. Well, let's jump into God's word this morning. I love Jesus. I love his word. And uh, no better place than we've sung in our hearts. Let's hear the word of God today. And so if you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and open it. We're gonna be in John chapter 21. John is one of the writers of the Gospels. He's the last writer of the Gospel, and we're gonna look at the last chapter that he wrote in chapter 21. And so, but I want to read the very end of chapter 20, something that was laid on my heart just this morning in prayer, uh, so the guys don't have it on the team, but listen to how John ends chapter 20. He says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. To me, that sounds like a closing of a book. John's wrapped up his whole gospel. He, he put the bow on it. He finished it with chapter 20. And it's almost like he's sitting at his, I'm imagining a desk and a nice candle and the, the ambiance is right. And he, he finishes writing and he puts his pen down and the Holy Spirit says, John, pick up the pen. Tell them about the meal. Tell them about that one more meal. Tell them about that time Jesus showed up to you and to Peter. They need to know about it. You're not done yet writing the gospel. And so John, in his faithfulness and his obedience, he picks up the pen and he puts to pen the words that we'll read this morning. Now what I want us to do really quickly is I want us to sit in the scripture. So easy, it's so easy for us to, to, to read scripture, and especially if we've been around the church for a little while, if we've read some of the scripture, it's so easy for us to read the scripture in light of what's gonna happen. We know what's coming, and so we kind of read quickly, we read through it pretty fast, and, and, and there's so much that we miss, there's so much context, because the reality is, that's not how the scripture was lived out. Peter doesn't walk through this moment knowing what's to come. Peter walks in this moment like I walk in my moment of life, and you walk in your moment of life right now, having this thing happening, having these questions, having this life that you've lived, not knowing what's next. But the author of life does. Jesus knows what's next. So Peter, real quick, Peter gets called on a beach really early on with Jesus. And Jesus says, follow me. And he follows him. And for three years, Peter becomes like one of the inside guys with James and John, two other disciples. And they get to see things no one else got to see. They get to see Jesus in his full majesty, in his full glory on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah standing there talking. And they hear the Father speak to Peter. And Peter like starts talking and the Father's like, hey, be quiet, listen to my son. It's Peter that gets to walk on water with Jesus for a few moments. It's Peter that he's the first disciple to say, Jesus, you are the Lord, the Messiah, the one that we've waited to come for so long. 
But it's also Peter that in his zeal and in his short temper and in his running really quick, he's the one that says something to Jesus and Jesus looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. It's Peter that pulls the sword out the night that Jesus is betrayed. It's Peter that on the night that he is betrayed at the Last Supper, Peter says, I will never leave you, Jesus. And Jesus says, no, Peter, you'll deny me three times tonight. And it happened that way. It's Peter, though, at the morning of the resurrection, when the women who had faith and the men were scared away, thinking something was gonna happen to them, the women were like, we got faith for this. They go to the tomb, they see it open, they meet with an angel, and the angel of the Lord said this, go tell his disciples that he is risen, and Peter, and Peter. And so now we find Peter already met with Jesus twice post-resurrection. And that's where we find the story today. And I just believe Peter is asking some questions in his heart, in his soul. Like, what just happened? Like, what just happened with Jesus? Like, I saw him die. Now he's resurrected. It is true. He is the Messiah. He's the king. What did I do? I denied him. I said, I don't know him. I cursed about him. Does he love me? Is he done with me? Like, what's next? He's wrestling with all these questions. And I think that's why the Holy Spirit leads John to go pick up the pen, John. Tell him about the last meal together. So let's read it. Are you ready to read God's word? Yeah. Amen, amen. Here we go, John chapter 21. We're gonna read 19 verses. All right, you ready? Here we go. You're gonna get your Bible in reading in today. Chapter 21. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It appeared this to happen this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from the Canaan Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Well, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, well, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul, to haul in the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer, outer garments around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about 100 yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew that it was Jesus, the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did with the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Jesus would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We are finishing, we are officially over with the holiday season, finishing this weekend. And so maybe, hopefully for some of you, you're like, finally the family is out of the house. They've gone back to where they came from. Uh, we can just kind of have some peace and quiet. And, and maybe that's what it is. But let me ask you this. You probably had a lot of, of food over the holidays. When's the last time that you had great food? 
Like, I mean, great food. I love food. Like, I know I don't look like it, but I love food. And so, I mean, everything from like my favorite is like a bone-in ribeye, reverse seared, in the oven for a little bit, put the green egg at like 850, and then put it on like four seconds each side, we're good to go, like that's it. But as much as I love that meal, I also love Little Debbie. And, uh, and so... It is a problem. My wife cleared this with us uh, when we got married. She said, uh, listen, I know you're married to me, but you're dating another person, and her name's Little Debbie, and you're spending way too much time with her. And, uh, and she knew that by how many rappers were in my car, and she would get in and see all the you know, Christmas cakes and the other stuff. And so anyway, um, it's still a problem, if I'm honest. I've just learned to throw those things away, you know? And so, but I love, love, love food. But let me ask you this. When's the last time you had a great meal? A great meal. And you may be asking, like, what's the difference in great food and great meal? It's the company. The company that surrounds the table. I mean, that really makes the meal. That makes it all. And so when we, like, like I said, we got here on Thursday night, and so when, when a friend says, hey, let's go to Tex-Mex, we're like, great food, great company, all day, every day, we're in. When somebody says, let's go to True Food and let's have lunch together, great friends, great meal, all the way. And then when somebody like stepped up their game a little bit and they were like, come to our house and we'll grill you tenderloin, I was like, even better, great meal, great company. Like, this is what I'm talking about. Like, I love this, and I don't know where I I heard this from, I heard it years ago, but if you tell me the way that you will interact with someone over food, I can pretty much tell you the level of relationship you have with them. So here we go, we'll just go really quick. First level of relationship over food is like you met for coffee at Starbucks. Just a quick little outing. Then the next is like you had lunch together on your lunch break and then you hurried back to the office. The next is that you had dinner together at a restaurant. The next level of friendship and around food would be that, that you and your family, maybe your kids or someone like that, like you all went out to dinner together and it was just a slow paced meal. The next is in your home, obviously, right? So then like you're inviting people into your sanctuary, your safe place, your oasis, and you're, you're making a meal for them. But there's a next level. The next level is when you're sitting in your home on your couch and the front door opens before it and they didn't call you and they walk in and they go to your kitchen, open your fridge, your pantry and begin to just make food out of the ordinary and, and then come and sit on your couch and say, hi, and here's the way you know it's the, that level of friendship, you don't mind it. You probably got like one, two, three people in that category. And this is what I love about Jesus. Jesus lived in this unforced rhythm of grace around meals. He turned ordinary water and ordinary food into these immaculate meals. He does it with the woman at the well. I mean, this is just water drawn from a well. I mean, it's only just a cup of water, and yet it wrecks her life for the greatest good. It changes her life forever. He does it with Matthew, the tax collector. He does it when he says, hey, we're all eating at your house. Like we're eating there and invite all your friends. He does it with the Pharisees. And how does Jesus spend the last night of his time on the earth before his death, burial, and resurrection? He spends it with his people, his disciples, around a meal together. Jesus uses not just food, but a meal and company together to bring you into relationship, to restore you, to redeem you, to call you his own, to remind you of who he is. And that's what I love about John in this moment. John's finished his gospel, and Jesus, the Holy Spirit says, John, tell him about the meal. Because I think Jesus was thinking about you in this moment. I think Jesus was thinking about you and me in this moment because he knew in 2022 you would hold some of those same questions that Peter held. Did I miss it? What just happened? What's next? This like inner turmoil, this inner dialogue, this inner questions. And the Holy Spirit tells John, John, you gotta tell him about the last meal. So let's look at it. The meal starts in Galilee and Peter and the disciples are in Galilee and they are there. And I don't think it's out of boredom that Peter makes this comment. I think it's out of like this inner turmoil that he's had birthed this moment in Peter. And Peter goes, you know what, guys? I'm just gonna go fishing. 
I'm just going back, I'm going fishing. And so he goes back fishing and all the guys go with him and they fish all night long and they catch nothing. They catch nothing. Susan, have you realized this? Like the disciples are fishermen and every time we hear a story about them fishing, they never catch anything. Like they're terrible fishermen. Like, I don't know how they make a living. They, every story is like, they didn't catch anything. They, Jesus showed up, they caught something. They didn't ever catch anything. And so, so they're fishing, and it's, it's, it's daybreak. John does this beautiful work all throughout his gospels of dark and light. And so in this moment, it's daybreak. The sun's rising. The fog is just over the water. They're about 100 yards out. Picture it with me. And there stands a guy on the beach, and he yells out to them. He's like, hey, you got any fish? And Peter's like, no. Like out of frustration, like, no, we have nothing. And he's like, well, try the right side of the boat, which is like, come on, Jesus. Like, don't you think they tried the right side of the boat? And so they throw it on the right side of the boat and they get this enormous amount of fish in. And John looks at Peter and he says these words, the same words they said on the resurrection morning. He said, it is the Lord. Like, come on, John. Come on, Peter. Didymus. Nathan, that's a cool name, right? Didymus, if you're looking for a child name, I think that's a good one. Didymus, like, like, you didn't realize it was Jesus? You spent three years with him. Like, I know he's on the shore, but you didn't realize it was him? And I don't know what led me to do this. I just did like a little Google search because I haven't been to the Holy Land yet. And so I did a little Google search. Last time they met Jesus, it was in Jerusalem. Now they're in Galilee. How far is that? It's about 100 miles. So Peter and James and John and the disciples, they haven't just gone fishing, they've gone back home. They've made the walk back home to, to, to go back to the way of life that it had been. To say, I, I know who Jesus is, but, but man, we're going back here. In this moment of Jesus, like saying like, it is the Lord. And I mean, it is incredible. The fact that Jesus shows up on this, on this, on this beach 100 miles away at daybreak without telling them he's coming. And the truth is this, for them and for you, that Jesus will surprise you by showing up wherever you are. That's the truth of this moment. Jesus will show up wherever you are. And he'll surprise you by doing it. He will surprise you by doing it. And he performs a miracle in this moment for the people, for Peter, for Andrew, for them. And it's the same miracle that he's performed for them before. So not only will Jesus show up and surprise you right where you are, he will remind you who he is. He'll show up, he'll surprise you, he'll remind you who he is. And I don't know your story, I don't know anybody's story in here. I'm new, thank you. Like, I don't know your story, but here's what I know. Whether you followed Jesus for a long time or you haven't followed Jesus and you're just curious, you just walked in here or someone said, let's go to brunch and they, you ended up here on the way to brunch. I don't know, like, but the reality is this. Jesus has met with you before. You may not know it. You may have missed it. But the truth is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit has met with you before. And so Jesus reminds them through a miracle that it's him. And boom, right out of the gate, Peter's like in his zeal, in his passion, he's like, I gotta be with Jesus. And so he like throws on the coat, he forgets the fish, he jumps in the water, it's about 100 yards, and he just starts like, you know, overhand, overhand, he starts swimming in. And I love the, I love the language of John, he's like, well, we just rowed in. And you know, like they're in the boat, and I just picture like John in the boat with Peter swimming right beside the boat, like Peter, get in the boat. And Peter's like, I just wanna get there, I just wanna get there, and he's like, get in the boat, Peter, like it's a lot easier. And he's like, shut up, you know, like he's like, just get in the boat. But Peter walks up, he gets out of the water, he put on his coat, so it's just like drenching wet. This isn't like rain resistant Patagonia stuff, like this is just like just nasty wet coat. And he gets out and he does what you would do when you embrace somebody that you haven't seen for a long time. He like embraces Jesus, like he holds him. And then he does the thing where he backs away for a second and he holds his face, you know. Like we're going home to our two and a half year old little girl and um, we haven't seen her in five days. And when I get with her, her name's Emmy Joe. When I get with her and every night before she goes to bed, I hold her face and she holds my face and I say, I love you. And she goes, I love you, daddy. And I say, I'm so proud of you, Emmy. And she goes, I'm proud of you, daddy. <laughs> and I go, you're my sweetheart. I give her a hug, give her a kiss. She goes, but Peter would have done that. He'd have put his hands on Jesus' face. I can't believe you're here. Like weren't you in Jerusalem? Like last week I saw you, what, what are you doing here? But in this conversation, here's what I think Peter happened. Peter looks at Jesus and then he sees right here the fire that Jesus has built on the beach for breakfast. And then he looks at Jesus 
And he looks at the fire. He looks at Jesus. He looks at the fire. And he would have remembered what happened the last time he looked at the fire and he looked at Jesus. It's the darkest night of his soul. It's the worst moment he's ever had. Let's read it. It's in Luke's gospel. Then seizing him, meaning Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest and Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. But a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied, second denial. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. The last time Peter looked at Jesus by a charcoal fire was his darkest night. And now, a week and a half, two weeks later, they're on a beach, Peter, charcoal fire, Jesus. I know Pastor Mark loves to tell you guys about words in the old language, and so I have, I brought a word with you, for me, with us this morning, and this is the word, anthrakia. You say that with me? Anthrakia. It's used only twice in all of Scripture. All of Scripture is used twice, and it's used both times in John's Gospel, and it's actually in John's writing of Peter's denial, talking about that fire that we just spoke about around the courtyard when Peter denied Jesus, and it's described about this fire here in John 21. Peter will surprise you by showing up, or Jesus will surprise you by showing up where he is. Peter will remind, or Jesus will remind you who he is. And Jesus will join you in the dirt of your life. He will join you right there in that moment that you didn't want him to join you in. If you're honest, it's the darkest night of your soul. You didn't want that moment. And Jesus is being so intentional here. Like, let's be honest. The world has no problem reminding you of where you messed up your failed marriage, your failed relationships, the bankruptcy, the addiction you said you wouldn't go back to, the child that won't speak to you, the friend that you betrayed, all of these things that we hold in our past, the world has no problem reminding you of those things. And even if the world did it, your own shame will remind you of those things time and time again. And so I think it's just, it's the love of the Father, what it is, that Jesus is showing us, hey, I'm actually here to redeem you. And he's setting the scene up so intentionally not to look at Peter and go, you were bad, you denied me right here of this fire, so I'm gonna make a fire to remind you about how bad you were. No, he's going, hey, I'm gently and kindly and lovingly redeeming you in this moment. Because although Jesus will join you in the dirt of life, Jesus will restore all that is broken. Jesus will restore all the dirt that you have carried. And so I'm not gonna put this on the screen, but, but just hear these words. Jesus has this meal and they break bread together and they break these things. And so then they have, a, they have this conversation and, and Jesus goes, Peter, do you love me? Remember, he, Peter denied Jesus three times. He goes, Peter, do you love me? And, and Peter goes, of course I love you. Jesus goes, Peter, do you love me? And he goes, yes, I love you. Feed my sheep, take care of my lambs. Jesus, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And even in that last answer where Jesus or Peter says, you know all things, it lets us know Jesus wasn't questioning whether the fact that Peter loved him or not. That's never in Jesus's heart, does Peter love me anymore? But Peter needed to hear his own mouth with his own ears birthed from his own spirit and his own soul go, Jesus, I love you with everything. I love you with all that I've got. I know I denied you three times and I made a mistake, but you are redeeming me. You are pulling me back. You are offering grace and mercy and you are abundantly pouring it over my life right now. Yes, I love you. Jesus doesn't need to know Peter loves him. Peter needs to know Peter loves Jesus. So often we just need to go, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. So after all this, the surprise meeting, the miracle, the embrace, the breakfast, the restoration. What's the call? What's Jesus gonna ask of Peter in this moment? What's Peter, Jesus asking of us in this moment? He asked us the same thing. Jesus will ask you 
to follow him. He'll first ask you, do you love him? And then he'll say, will you follow me? Will you follow me? And I don't know why this holds, this scripture I'm about to show you holds so much weight in my soul, but it it just does. And it's Matthew, it's in the first time Peter meets Jesus. Hear these words right here. It says this, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother, Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come and follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. So the first time Peter meets Jesus is on a beach in Matthew chapter four. He lives his life, he does all the things, he does all the things, he does all the things. Resurrection, does all the things. Denial, does all the things. John 21, Jesus meets Peter on a beach. And with just a little bit of study, here's what holds weight. The beach in John 21 is the same beach of Matthew chapter four. Jesus goes, I'll go back through all the stuff and I will meet you right back in the place that I met you the very first time. I am restoring you, I am redeeming you, I am calling you my own will, you follow me. And so the question for us, some of us need to hear that this morning. Do you love Jesus? Doesn't mean you have it all figured out, right? Matthew chapter four, Peter doesn't know anything, but he's asked to follow him. John 21, he says, will you follow me? Do you love me? I don't know where you are today. Some of us are like prodigal sons and we've gone away and Jesus is saying, hey, I wanna restore you back into the family. I wanna restore you back home. And some of us are like the older son in that story. Pastor Mark just preached an incredible sermon out a few weeks ago. Maybe you're like the older son and God's saying, hey, you've been in my house this whole time and you haven't accessed all that I have for you. I've got everything for you, the older son. I'm trying to restore you within the home. All of us are being restored. And it's just this word that we love in the Wesleyan theology, this heritage that we call, it's called sanctification. Jesus is constantly creating us and calling us back to him to be more like him. Will you follow me? This is more than a meal. This is more than fish and bread. This is an invitation from rascal to redeemed, from broken to whole, to slave to free, from dark to light, from orphan to a beloved child, from hurt to healed, from despaired to faithful, from lonely to embraced, from rejected to loved. This is more than a meal. This is an invitation to be with our Lord in everything, in everything, and he knows all the dirt. He knows it, but he says, do you love me, Sharon? Do you love me, Paul? Do you love me, Carl? Do you love me, Emily? Do you love me, Craig? Do you love me, Heather? Do you love me, John? Do you love me? He says, follow me. He's not good about giving you the indirection. Let me just be honest. He's not good about telling you where you're going always, but he's asking, will you follow me? It's more than a meal. It's an invitation to life in Christ. So in closing, I just wanna tell you this little uh, quote that I heard this past year from a pastor named John Tyson who is up in New York City, author and writer and stuff like that, a really great guy. And, uh, and he said this at a conference I was with him at earlier in April in Nashville, and I just can't get away from it. He said, when God in his sovereignty and his wisdom and his righteousness and his goodness when God looked at the span of all creation, all of it from the very beginning to the very end when he will return, he looked at 2022, January 2nd, and he called your name out, 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 and he called your name out. And he said, you are my beloved, and I need you here now with all the things that you carry, all the good, all the bad, the story of life that you have walked. I need you now for my kingdom, for my glory, to tell people about me, to fall in love with me, to offer the life that you walk in. I need you now. Think about it, in all of history, Jesus called your name and said, I need them here now for my kingdom. So you are seen by the Father. You are seen by the Son. You are seen. 
you have been drawn here by the Holy Spirit. And he's asked the two questions, do you love me? Will you follow me? And so I don't know if you've put the pin down in your life and go, well, it's just gonna lead out this way. The Holy Spirit's saying, pick the pin back up. Have one more meal with me. Have another meal with me. Let me restore you. Let me surprise you where I'll meet you. Let me remind you of who I am. Let me meet you in the dirt. And here's what I love. Jesus doesn't meet us in the dirt from afar, but he brings everything from the throne of heaven down into the dirt, all the holiness, all his righteousness, and he just hides us in it. He hides us in who he is. So when the Father looks at us, he doesn't see us in all the mess. He sees us hidden in his Son, and the Holy Spirit lives within us and sanctifies us and calls us to live a life through the lens of the Son. And so he's inviting you to have a meal with him today with bread and juice. And can I be honest? I love food. This isn't the best cracker you're ever gonna have. And this isn't the best juice or wine you'll ever drink. But because Jesus is present in these elements with us in this moment, it has the potential to be the best meal you've ever had. And you don't have to do anything but receive it. Jesus tells Peter on the beach, I didn't get to tell the first service this, Jesus tells Peter on the beach, hey, bring some fish and put it on the fire. He already had fish on the fire, but he asked Peter to bring fish and put it on the fire. Where did Peter get the fish? Oh, yeah, Jesus gave him the fish. Whatever God's calling you into, inviting you into his work, he's already given you everything that you need right now to enter into the work that he's got for you. So you're invited to his table with two questions. Do you love me? He doesn't say, do you have it all figured out? Do you have all the questions? Do you love me? Will you follow me? Pastor Susan is gonna lead us in holy communion now as we gather at the table of our Lord and risen Savior. Amen.